Hey, so in this video, I'm going to go over one production example for using Python in your day to day workflow. So I've got this little walk cycle here on this character. By the way, you guys can get this for free on our website, decog.com, uh, and you can download it and, you know, do all that kind of good stuff. Uh, but I've got this walk cycle here, and if I if I just play it back, it looks pretty good from afar. A little a little bit exaggerated, if you ask me, but you know it kind of gives it a little bit of character, and it looks okay from afar. And if I come in close, you can see that okay, this foot is actually it's actually going through the ground. And it's it's going through the ground quite badly actually, and it's kind of popping up and down in uh, a bunch of different frames. And that's that's going to be a problem. And if I look at this foot on this back foot here, you can see it's doing the same thing where it's kind of going through the ground at the beginning and then it's going back to normal. And if I just take a look at the graph editor, you can kind of see what's happening. If I look at the translate Y value, you can see indeed some of these values are going below zero. And to fix it, normally what you do is you can just come here and you just set it back to zero. So, you know, it's nice and flat. Uh, but that's a little bit manual and uh, you know, I can come in and do the same. You can see we've got some keys here that are below zero. I can do the same and just set it back to zero. And it's, it's all nice and flat now. But what I've actually done is I've written a Python script that does this for me. So it's not too long. If I select it and I run this, you can see it's gone through and it's set all the keys that it's found that are below zero and it's set it back to zero. So I'm gonna do the same thing for this other foot here. So grab this guy, come to translate Y. And this is where you guys can see, and if I run this, it's setting it back to zero. So how do we do this? Let me just start a fresh scene and new Python tab. And then I'll create a little cube and we can use this cube as our test uh, example, as our test case. So I'll just show the grid here and then maybe make my timeline a little bit shorter. And then I'll just set a bunch of keys. So I want some of these to be above zero and some to be below zero. Maybe I'll have a couple that are below zero. And uh, this way, now I've got keys that are going above and below this zero point. And I basically want to take all the keyframes that have anything below this zero point and just snap it back to zero, basically. Just like that. But I wanna do it programmatically. So I don't wanna to have to manually do this. So what I can do is import maya.cmds as cmds. And now I wanna store my selection. sl is equal to true. And if you remember, this just gets our selection. So if I run this and take a look at cell, you can see it's just giving us a list with our selected object in there, nothing crazy. But now I wanna get all the keyframes of this object. And we can use the CMDS keyframe function in order to do this. So what does CMDS keyframe take? Well, it needs to operate on an object first of all, so I can just give it the object. And by default, it's gonna try and move keys this CMDS keyframe function can do a bunch of different things. It can uh, move keys, but it can also query keys. So I want to query all the keyframes that I have key. So if I run this by default, it's going to try to move keys and it's giving me an error. It's saying cannot move keys. Let me zoom in a little. You know, it's saying we cannot move the keys, but I don't want to move the keys anyway. What I want to do is query the keys. So we can do that using this Q flag. Q is equal to true. And what Q means is just query and query will actually change what this command is doing. So instead of trying to move keys, we're just querying all the different keyframes we have. And if I run this, you can see we're getting a list, but this list looks a little bit weird. You know, we've got a bunch of ones here and then we've got like all these other ones down there. And in the middle here, it looks like you know, we're actually getting something that kind of resembles what we have keyframed here. So if you look at here, I've got keyframes on one and on six and on 11, 14, 
and 20, etc. You, you get the idea. But what are all these extra ones? Well, what this keyframe command does by default is it just looks at all the channels that we have keyframes on and it kind of just gives us a list back for all the channels and all the keyframes on all the channels. So if I look at translate X here, you can see we only have one keyframe. And if I look at translate Y, we have a bunch here. And in all these other channels, we only have keyframes on frame one. That's why it's returning one for all these other channels. And if I just come through and keyframe all the channels now on every keyframe, so you can see here, we don't have keyframes on everything. If I just keyframe everything for all these keyframes, and then I run this keyframe command, I think I said keyframes just like a hundred times just then. But if I run this command, you can see that we have just an insane amount of values, but it looks like we have the data in here. It's just showing me the keyframes for every single channel. And I just want more of an overview of the entire object, not every single channel. So to do that, we can store keyframes. So I want to store this variable in this keyframes variable store all my keyframes. And then what I can do is use this set function. And what this set function does is it takes a collection. So in this example, we're going to use this variable. It'll take a collection and then it'll just give you the unique values in that. So if I run this, you can see now I have just the unique values inside of this collection rather than all the different channels. Now it's kind of just saying like, Hey, if it's the same uh, value, if you see the same value, just disregard it, you know? And now we have this nice little, uh, set object, but this set object isn't quite the same data type as a list or as a tuple or any kind of data type that we've encountered. It's always going to give you a unique collection of objects. So for example, if I had a list where I have some letters, A, B, C, and maybe I have a bunch of extra A's in there and maybe an extra B and I make a set out of this, you'll see what happens if I run this. Now you can see it's just giving me a unique uh, collection rather than a un like um, a collection with duplicates in there. So it's getting rid of all the duplicates, but it's not a list. So that's also a bit of a problem because lists are ordered and sets are not ordered. So for example, if I just remove this A and I put B there and I run this again, you can see that it's, it's kind of, it's trying to set the order. But if I do something weird, maybe if I do B A and, um, put BA there again. Let's see what happens. You can see it's the order isn't predictable. You know, it's not going by the order that I give it. It's kind of just mixing the order up in whichever way is most efficient for the computer. And I actually want to order my set to ensure that, you know, all my keyframes are starting from the lowest keyframe number to the highest one. So what I can actually do is sort it. So I can use this sorted function and what is sorted function. This is also built into Python is it'll take any kind of collection and it'll sort it and it'll give me a list and the list will guarantee, um, you know, to, to have this kind of ascending order. And of course we can do some cool things with sorted. I can reverse it. So I can say reverse is equal to true. And that'll take basically the list and it'll reverse the order. So it's starting from the highest of the highest number to the lowest number rather than the lowest to highest. But I don't want to reverse. I just want to go from lowest to highest. So I know that we're kind of going from frame one, then to six, then to 11 and kind of going up in this um, ordered fashion. And, you know, in this example, we'd actually need to sort this uh, list, but it's just a good habit to have just to make sure that 
what you're doing has some predictable results. So if you're doing, if you're using these keyframes to do some other operation that is time dependent, you know, you definitely don't want to be jumping from this keyframe to this one and then back to this one and then to this one, you know, you, you have a bit more of a predictable order. So now that I sorted it, I want to just override my keyframes variable with this new sorted list. So now that I have this sorted list, what I want to do is I want to just iterate over this sorted list. So I can say for I in keyframes, and I want to get the value of translate Y at every keyframe that we have. So it's basically going to jump through all these keyframes and it's going to look at the translate Y value. So to do that, we just loop over this keyframes list and then I want to get the attribute of translate Y. So I'm going to use a little bit of string formatting here, translate Y, and I want to just get my selected object, my first selection. So what this is going to do is by default, it's going to give me the value of translate Y, but at whichever frame that my time slider is at. So my little um, time slider indicator. So if I had this at frame five, for example, and I run this, I get a very different value than if I'm at frame 11 and I run this. But what we want is we want the value at the keyframe that we're iterating over because we're gonna iterate over all these keyframes. And basically at any keyframe that we're at, I want the translate Y value of that. And get adder actually has a really handy time flag that I think not a lot of people know about. But if you use this time flag, what we can actually do is, for example, if I give the time flag, let's just say 24, and I wanna get the value of 24 and I run this, you can see that it's giving me a different value than where I'm currently at. I'm currently on frame six and the value is 2.9, but on frame 24, the value is actually negative 1.1. So that's kind of what it's giving me back. It's giving me the value of whatever, at, like, whatever attribute I'm trying to get, but at this time. So rather than using a fixed number, we can actually just give it this keyframe number because we're iterating over all our keyframes. So now I can print this and we can run this and you can see what happens. It's getting all the different values for all the different keyframes we have. And if I come to the very end and I set, for example, frame 30, I'll set 10. So we're like all the way up there at 10 and I run this again, you can see the last value is 10. So it's basically iterating over all our keyframes, getting that translate Y value. And we can use this now. I want to store this in a va uh, value variable. And then what I can do is say if value is less than zero. So we're looking at all the different values now and saying, hey, if it's less than zero, let's do something. I don't want these less than zero values. I want to clamp them to zero. So what I can actually do now is do cms.set adder. But the problem with set adder, I'll just copy this here. I want to set the translate Y. The problem with set adder is set adder doesn't have this nice little time flag. We can't actually use time is equal to I. So if I run this, it's going to error out. It says here, if I come all the way down, it says inval invalid flag time. So we actually can't set values at a particular time. So this makes it a little bit difficult now to do what we want. So what I actually want to do is I want to move our timeline indicator to whichever flag that we're at and then set the value and then set a keyframe. So to do that, we can use the current time function. So I'll just copy this current time function down here and we can kind of just go over what it does. So if I just run it on its own, it's, um, it's going to complain. Let me see. Yeah, it's going to complain because what it's trying to do is it's trying to set the current time slider to a particular frame. So I can say frame one and then run this and it will move my timeline indicator to frame one. Or I can say move, move it to 15. You can see it's moving it to 15 now. So that's what it does by default. But what we also can do some other cool things is we can query time so I can run this 
So to give me the the frame number that I'm currently on, so I can be on frame seven and I'll run this, it'll query and say, okay, you're at frame seven. But we're actually just gonna set the time, we're not gonna query it in this instance. So coming back up to here, I can just set the timeline slider to the frame that we're iterating over so that it's moving the timeline slider to whichever frame. So like it'll start at one and then when we go to the next iteration of the loop, it'll move it to six. And then we can set the value of Y, the translate Y, and I just wanna set it to zero. So if the value is below zero, it'll move the timeline slider to that particular frame and it'll set it back to zero. And that's, that's it really. If I uh, run this command now, you can see that it's kind of gone through and it's, it's done just that. Now it's clamped all the translate Y values so that they never go below zero. And if I just show my graph editor, you can see it's giving me this nice flat value now. And of course I can just, um, if I undo and I just run this command again, just so you guys can see what it's actually doing. You can see it's just taking all the keys below zero and it's moving it back to zero now. Yeah, and that's it pretty much. But uh, there's one last thing I wanna do just to be sure, because you might not have auto keyframe on. So if you're someone that doesn't really work with auto keys, let me just undo. So the cube's going back below zero. So if you don't use auto keys, so if I just turn my auto keyframe off, you can't quite see it, it's off screen, but this little button, if I, I had it on before, if I just turn it off and I run this now, it's gonna try to do the thing, but if I play it back, you can see it's not working because it's not setting a keyframe. It's just moving the object, but it hasn't set the keyframe there. So when you just play it back again, it's going to, it's going to try to just go back to whichever keyframe it was set to. So the safest way is just to set the keyframe ourselves. So we can use this set keyframe command. And then we basically take this whole line here and just paste it there. And we're just saying, hey, set the keyframe, translate Y for this object. So that after we move it, we also set the keyframe. So now when I run this code, you can see it's gonna move the cube back, but it's also setting a keyframe. So when I drag, you can see it's set the keyframe and that's just the safest way to do it. And now basically this script, you can apply to any object. So like our foot control, I can go back to our scene and you can see we have that issue still in this file where the foot is going below zero. Now I can grab this control, run this script and just give it a little scrub so it updates the timeline. And you can see now it's set it so that it's not going through the ground anymore. And of course I can just make this little button, you know, drag it on the shelf and we're good to go. And yeah, that's pretty much it for this production example. I'm gonna to try to do more production examples in the future and build a little script around, you know, a particular problem that you might encounter in production. And if you guys have any ideas, make sure you drop it in the comments. I'll take a look through them and see if it's feasible to, you know, to script it in 20 minutes. Um, and if it is, then yeah, I'll make a video around it and post it up for you guys. So yeah, stick around. Mm -hmm.